Breakfast puppies? Welcome to Have Movies Will Game, the only podcast on the globe where we take you, our friendly listener, through the best and worst movies of yesterday and today, and then discuss ways that you can play them at your gaming table. In every episode, our intrepid hosts, Matthew, Dusty, and Nathaniel, will filibuster fondly over facts and feelings of your favorite films, and then get to the glorious gaming goodness, giving Game Masters great gimmicks on generating golden genius. Have Movies Will Game, brought to you through the electronic wonder of the internet. Now, let's start the show! Smoking and guns and drinking while pregnant and guns smoking, in an airplane. smoking in an, in an airport. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Fuck it, man. I miss America. It was, I miss America. <laughs> oh my God. I saw it. I'm like, oh yeah, you could smoke in, in an airport. Just like you'd smoke in a, in a, like a mall. I mean, I remember going to the airport with my dad and him like lighting up outside and just going in and that, that poof around him as he went yeah. through the sliding doors. Yeah. You know, back where we figured out that, that, that technology that we seem to have lost called exhaust fans. <laughs> that we don't have anymore. We do. They're in casinos. Ah. Oh my god! Have you been into a casino lately? Oh yeah. That allows smoking. Oh yeah. It's a blue haze. Well, it's no, just a it blue fucking haze. The, not the one uh, in Lincoln City, but there's the one on the back highway. Is it the Chinook? No, the Chinook Winds is the one in Lincoln City. You know what happens if you if you get all that secondhand smoke? You die hard. <laughs> <laughs> God damn it. Segway. <laughs> Hi, I'm Matthew. And I'm Dusty. And I'm Nathaniel. And the movie we're doing this week is Die, Die Hard. Hard. Now, 1988, yeah. Bruce Willis. It's a Christmas movie. The original. Yes. yes. It was based on Roderick Thorpe's 1979 novel, Nothing Lasts Forever, which was actually a sequel to a 1966 movie called The Detective. What's a Thorpe? That's a writer. Oh. Uh, and that was in, uh, adapted into a film by the same name, starring Frank Sinatra. Uh, who at that time was obviously a big <laughs> box office success. And when this went into production, they were obligated to ask Frank Sinatra to play the part of John McClane. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really glad they didn't. That would have him, been him being plus 70 years old in that time. He, he, he actually blue turned eyes. the project down. Good. Um, Good. The story was then changed to have no connection whatsoever to the detective. Arnold Schwarzenegger declined the role as he wished to broaden his appeal by attempting comedy, which eventually became Twins. I thought it was going to be Kindergarten Cop. <laughs> <laughs> and although it has been rumored that Die Hard at this point in that project's life was repurposed to be a sequel to Schwarzenegger's 85 action film Commando, the scriptwriter has denied that ever since. I think to date, this movie has the most callbacks actor wise to our entire catalog collected. I can think of at least four. All right, yeah. go. Okay. Go. Bruce Willis, mm-hmm. obviously. Yeah. Alan Rickman, yes. obviously. Mm-hmm. Robert Davi. Okay. Yeah. Who's that? Who that? Uh, Robert Davi was the FBI dude. The one from Nam or the other one? The one from Nam. Okay. Yeah, the one that said, uh, you know, it feels like we're just in Saigon. And his buddy was like, I was 13, Boom, dickhead. dickhead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and Al Young. Oh, okay. Al Young being the Fu Manchu mm-hmm. Asia guy. Who was also in Big in Trouble in Big, Little China. Yeah. 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 I think and he was way more badass clouds. in Big Trouble yeah. in Little China. And there, yeah, there, yeah, there's, there's the shout outs to that. There's also, yeah. you know, the shout outs to Goonies in this because of the of the FBI agent. He was one of the Fratellis. You know, those are just actors appearing in other movies. Those aren't shout outs. You guys know that, right? Yeah, we know that. Be nice. Okay. But we're giving <laughs> shout outs to our movies because we're awesome that way. Oh, I see. You're, you're, what we're trying to do here is is push our own back catalog. I, I get that. All right. Yeah. Cool. Carry on. So <laughs> one thing I have to say real quick. So you know how much like hatred J.J. Abrams gets for using Len Flares in his movies? Who's Len Flares? What Len does he want to Yeah, Len Flares. Who's this guy? Excuse me. I don't Len know. Flares. What part's he been playing? <laughs> Lens Flares. You know? Yeah, players. yeah. I know what you're talking okay. about. <laughs> this movie Lens had, Flares. Uh, had over. So, I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> this movie had so many Lens Flares. It was... It, 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 I almost got a migraine from I think I was like twitching at some point. I think the difference being... I want to get more stupider filming. I think the yeah, difference being... <laughs> oh, yeah. We're poor and gr- old granddad because we're taking it back to our roots. Anyway... <laughs> I think the difference being that most of those lens flares were just there and they dealt with them. Yeah. Whereas Abrams digitally inserts them into yeah. digital movies. I where, understand yeah. that, but this movie had like a massive amount of lens flares. I will say this. There are levels of Abrams. Mm-hmm. This was nowhere near, shall we say, a Star Trek amount of lens flare. I had more. No. 
I I I will search that online. I okay, think you go is. ahead. Is there like an internet movie lens flare Probably. database? <laughs> There's seven point five billion people on this planet. I'll <laughs> bet you, I'll bet you money there is. There is yeah. a website out there that will tell you like when a woman gets naked in a movie and exactly what second that Dude, happens. Th- th- that was in the 80s. That's, That's old reprehensible. Info. That's terrible. You need to tell me where that is so I can go write them a harshly worded letter. I mean, just like I, how can you, how when can we talked like about John Wick, you brought up the fact that there was when does the dog die.com. Yes, yeah, a good one. Yeah. <laughs> I want to give a, a, a call to a buddy of mine who told me after listening to that episode that he told his son of that website after we talked about it on the John Wick episode. And now whenever he watches anything with his son who just heard 10, I think today, possibly. Happy birthday, Thor. He has to go to that website the moment an animal appears. <laughs> Originally, right. the script yeah. for Die Hard was supposed to take place over three days. But the director, McTiernan, was inspired to have it take place over a single night uh, given by Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream. There were so many tweaks, though, to this script. Most of the film is actually ad-libbed and improvised. I, I figured that. How is this like Shakespeare? I uh, just said it was inspired to take it over a, a single night. That's what McTiernan said. I don't see. Is, is, is that a direct quote from him? Did yes, he draw it the is. Shakespeare no, it is. That is a <laughs> direct quote from him. Fuck. Yes, I know. I would no, not no, no, quote you're with that. That is not me. No, he, that was him saying... That was him quoting himself in an in a interview that he was inspired to have what, it take place What was place his over, name again? Uh, McTiernan. McTiernan, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> but on the other side of that coin, uh, D'Souza, the screenplay writer, the screenplay writer, screenwriter. Playwright? Exactly. Uh, said he Whee! wrote the script as if it were Hans Gruber being the protagonist. Oh, definitely. Yeah. No. Um, Alan Rickman, you you tore him apart. He did really good in this movie. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. This is, yeah. This is first, I thought, I this thought he was film. way better in this is, movie than he was is it in his Robin first or is his first, first major feature role? film? Yeah, first okay. feature film. He was uh, found. They were looking for uh, the antagonist, mm-hmm. and Sam Neill was actually initially up to yeah, play. He could have done it. He would have he been good. He yeah. would have been great. I think he would have done a better German accent. But uh, he ended up going <laughs> a different route. But would he have done as good fake American accent? He wouldn't have had to. We'll get to that. But there was a stage production of... Yeah, because he's an actual actor. There was a stage production that, that that the director went to, and he saw him. He's like, "This would be a a he'd be a perfect bad guy." So he approached him and said, "Well, yeah, I'll check it out." Lo- read the script and loved it. And, and he's been the bad guy ever. Since. Yep, pretty <laughs> and, much. And yeah. uh, D'Souza said, "Quote: If he had not planned the robbery and put it together, Bruce Willis's character would have just gone to the party and reconciled or not with his wife." You should sometimes think about looking at your movie through the point of view of the villain who is really driving the narrative, end quote. Also, I do want to valid point. Yeah. go back to something that you said, Matthew, and I will agree. You're absolutely right. This is a Christmas movie. Yeah. A lot mm-hmm. of people used to say that it's not, but I think our collective consciousness these days has well, come what, to an agreement. What, what happened is a lot of people said... Yeah. This is a Christmas movie. And then the internet, being the internet, said, This isn't a Christmas movie. You guys are dumb. Troll, 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 troll. Yeah. And just just come off it. It's fun. It's it, stupid. It, it's fun. And it happens at Christmas. And the only miracle is that John McClane lived. It's fantastic. It's also a movie about a family getting back together over the holidays. At least briefly enough to screw. But here's the thing. Uh, on the technical side of it, it was released in July. So it is not a Christmas release movie. You killed baby Jesus, Dusty. Yes, you I know did. That, right? I'm just <laughs> putting that out there. Nap-tap, I'm going to ruin the show nap-tap, right nap-tap, now. It baby is Jesus. set at Christmas in L.A. Please send hate mail to <laughs> Dusty at Have Movies for Game. <laughs> no, but I see it as a Christmas movie. I do. There are certain movies, like Thanksgiving movies for me, is are uh, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles and Trading Places. Christmas is this, Nightmare Before Christmas, and like Christmas Vacation. Gremlins. Gremlins. That's another one. <laughs> you know mine. <laughs> I've, been trying, I've been trying to work it in forever. We'll Maybe get to next that. Year. Maybe next year. Maybe there'll be a special present waiting for you under the podcast tree. <laughs> <laughs> Is it a pizza? <laughs> I hope so. But we'll get to that in a bit. The big bow. So John McTiernan uh, directed Fuck this you. movie. <laughs> and he has done movies such that you may have seen a couple of them. <laughs> This is going to be, oh my God. <laughs> I miss drinking during the show. Cheers, I, cheers, man. cheers. It's good to have you back. <laughs> Hello, darkness, my old friend. Oh, wow, that was a huge one. <laughs> I, I was really generous. <laughs> hey, <laughs> just pour that back. 
Oh, oh man. Whoa, this was a full bottle. <laughs> yes, it was. Oh, <laughs> I think I just took about three shots. We're, we're drinking out of, you can't see, of course, but we're drinking out of tumblers. I seem to have taken a rather more healthy swig than was good for me. I think I just did about three shots. So John McTiernan is the director Fuck for this you. movie. And you may have seen a few of his movies. Rollerball was one of them. Oh, now I get Wait, 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 wait. Are we talking about the original Rollerball or the LL Cool J Rollerball? I think the LL Cool J one. What? The Thomas Crown Affair, the remake. The 13th Warrior. Okay, okay, okay. Hunt for an October. Okay. Good okay. And Predator. Okay, I like this guy. So he initially Ooh. turned down being director for this, you know, not once, but multiple occasions. And his reason was that the material had... It, apparently, he said in an interview, it was too dark and too cynical for him. The original screenplay was a grim terrorist movie. And on uh, the second week of working on it, he said, listen, we need to get rid of the terrorism uh, because terrorism is there's no part of terrorism that's actually any fun. But robbers are fun bad guys. So let's make that make let's make this a date movie. He said I blame Robin Hood. <laughs> I, blame oh, I can tie Robin Hood into this movie. Well, well, well hold and on. you're going to hate it. Let's talk about terrorists. How the terrorists <laughs> are no fun. Terrorists used to be fun. <laughs> and then they stopped being fun. And, and now they're fun like, again. Because apparently, no, well, they're not fun. But now we use them in every fucking movie ever since 2001. Yeah. But Transformers, terrorists. 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 You see, I just say think that the Decepticons had some completely misunderstood values, really. It's, it's our fault for creating the Decepticons. <laughs> Oh my god! <laughs> it was three shots. I'm really sorry. <laughs> Plus, in, in addition to X number before we started rolling, I like Koki McBoardroom. Oh my god! The cocaine oh usage god. in this was hilarious. He just kept doing it too. Yeah. They're sitting because you know it, it, it wears off. He reaches know? into his pocket and just bumps again. Yeah. I like the part baby. where just before he dies, like the 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 robbers bring him in a can of coke because he probably at one point said I could use some coke and they yeah. Had, yeah. didn't know, so they just brought him a can of coke instead of another bump. I just wish they had shown the shot and like they had shown it from the back, and all you see is like dust go up. <laughs> they shot him right in the stash. Well, oddly enough, with uh with Alan Rickman, he really apparently did not like guns. So he would, he'd flinch anytime he pulled the trigger. So in the editing process, they had to go in and work around that because his flinching was too uh, over the top. So everything was cut at that last second from a different angle. I Speaking did not know that. His flinching, I understand that his last moment had a little bit of realism to it. Yes. His last moment had a, had a lot of realism to it because he was up. Did they hang him off the building? Or? Yeah. They, they actually, because this was before CG or, or heavy CG use. So they had him dangling. Uh, up it was like 40 or 50 feet up above the ground and the stunt coordinator said I'm gonna let go on three and they're like are you ready and he's like yeah okay so it one two and dropped and so that look on his face <laughs> that's is real huh real like oh shit you just dropped me and he dropped 40 feet that's fantastic oh man now Bruce Willis was not previously an action hero mm. He wasn't really a major actor before this. He had, the, in, the, in the very first scenes, he had like this weird late 80s lover boy sneer on his face. Have Do you, you know never, what I'm talking about? Have you never seen Moonlighting? Yeah. No. no, Moonlighting. Yeah. Yeah, that was, he was. I have hair on my chest. I watch action films. What's Moonlighting? Brute, that's. That was his show that he came from yeah. with um, Sybil Shepard. Shepard. Yeah. Wow, yeah, don't be stereo like, surround sound on Civil <laughs> Shepherd there. He was, he was a, like a detective, I think. Yeah. He was a television star yeah. before yeah. he was a movie star. Mm -hmm. And that look on his face is was basically that his thing? Look throughout yeah. Moonlighting. Yeah. Oh, yeah that's moon, unfortunate. Moonlighting yeah. was, uh, I think, uh, the alternate to, oh, uh, Remington Steel, pretty much, I think, back in the 80s. No, I, I grew up far oh, yeah, enough yeah. out in the country that mm -hmm. I didn't have a television. Oh, okay. Like there was a television, uh, but. It had a VCR attached to it, and that's all we gotcha. got. I only knew who Bruce Willis was because my mom watched Moonlighting. Did she like the yeah. sneer? <laughs> I don't she know. Really like the I've sneer. I've never asked her, Mom, if you're listening, and I hope you're not. <laughs> please tell me if you liked Bruce Willis's sneer. He initially <laughs> turned down the role due to his contracts with um, with Moonlighting, but Sybil Shepherd became pregnant, and Moonlight Moonlighting was shut down for like eleven weeks which provided him enough time to work on Die Hard. He was also paid 
a figure that was virtually unheard of at the time for an actor who had only starred in one moderately successful film and normally only paid major stars like Dustin Hoffman and Warren Beatty $5 million to take this role. And that's an 80s bucks. That was, that was 80s money, yeah. So um, much like Conan did to Arnie, this movie made Bruce. Yeah, it did. Like, yeah. Yeah. Uh, he was and he was fantastic in this movie. Uh, his physical acting was was great. Yeah. Uh, the way he moved, the way he dodged his big, stupid face. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it was great also on the fact that they didn't really know where the character was going as they were filming. Like, yeah. they didn't know where uh, his character was, what was going to do until about the halfway mark. They're like, just wing it. Go out there and do something and be kind of witty and fire a, bullet, fire a gun. I also like that this is his first action movie and he plays a character who has never been in an action movie. Like he plays, he, he is hurting. He is suffering. Oh yeah. He he's is bloody as fuck. Taking care mm-hmm. of his well being. He is trying to survive. He is not being a maverick and just gunning them down. He rules. runs away <laughs> yeah. for most of the movie. He is running like that, that whole yeah. sequence when he, he's going down the shaft and, and the, the strap of the gun and all of that. But everything leading up to that is he's not setting up an ambush. He's like, I need to fucking go. I yeah. need to fucking go. They're going to, kill me and yet he is still an action star and that i know matthew you like heroes i do and this is a heroic character this, this is this is an everyman character this is an everyman and that's character exactly what he is who yeah. rises up to be the hero yeah now the 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 falling down the shaft that you just made a a comment about where he, with the gun where he's holding on and falling down the elevator shaft or the 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 air shaft that was actually a really big screw up on the part of the stunt coordinator. What? Yeah, he that the he did fall. The stunt coordinator, the guy that was running that stunt, did fall. But the m- mistake was so good looking that they kept it in the movie. Oh, yeah, it was oh, a total cool. mess up. Like there was like he <laughs> slipped and fell, but and and just like barely grabbed on where he needed to be, and they just kept it in the movie. They're like, oh, that works. It was tense. Yeah. There was really good tension. In this you see, film. this is something Hollywood's missing these days. Yeah. If you maim the occasional actor, you get better performances. <laughs> this, is, this is very true. This is why they don't. This is why they get millions and millions and millions of dollars. Just, just maim them just a little bit. <laughs> so, do you, do you want to know the the list of people who were asked to play this movie before they got to Bruce Willis, or do yeah. you want to wait till later? Uh, no, let's do it now. Do yeah. it now. All right. Yeah, yeah. So here's a very long list. Actually, you have Charles Bronson. Blech. From, what from death wish Charles yeah. bronson's amazing once upon a time in the west the mechanic he would death not, wish. yeah those are that's good your Charles thing bronson not mine. movies but he would not have been good in this movie <laughs> he's a, he's not witty no he just stares he's, he's not squints. actually yeah, yeah he's not you're right you're right uh, robert de niro okay could have been was he skinny back then what was he skinny back yeah. then yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. He was this was skinny. after this is around the time of uh this is like midnight run right around taxi driver time. was no taxi driver was way 70s? before this Maybe? Uh, no. Then we have Schwarzenegger, which no, he would have been too bulky. Yeah, he's he, he he's, would have chewed up too much scenery. He would well, not no, have it's fit. Not that he would have <laughs> chewed up scenery. It's that he's the the charm of the character is the everyman. Yeah, and he is not an everyman. And and I think in eighty eight his accent was still a little too thick. It still is. Yeah, true. Uh, Richard Gere from Pretty Woman. He could have done it, but I don't, I, I, don't, I don't. I think he's too refined for the I role. Think he's yeah. too charming. Yeah. yeah. Clint yeah. Eastwood actually had the rights to this for a long time and wanted to play the character, but nothing came of it. So he, 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 would, have, he would have taken him a while to get that dribble. It, it out would of have his been Dirty Harry. He in, knows in it's a, a speaking role, right? <laughs> Burt Reynolds might have almost been too old. Yeah. Yeah. Even even when when was this? Eight, late eighty eight. Yeah. Yeah. Too old. Uh, Sylvester Stallone. No. Harrison no. Ford. Yeah, okay. Don I could have seen Harrison Ford. Who? Don Johnson. I can see Don Johnson. Uh, yeah. Nick Nolte. No. Mm, well, wait, wait. No, no, no. I was, I'm thinking Robert Redford. No, Nick Nolte. I always get those two confused in my yeah. head. I, I sometimes get yeah. Nick Nolte and Gary Busey mixed up. Yeah. I, that's the fair. same. <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah. It's like a triangle of people. Yeah. I, I never get Robert Redford and Gary Busey mixed it's, up. It's like they came from a family and one <laughs> ate healthy and got exercise and the other ate like Twinkies and Kool-Aid. And, and just went crazy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, then we have Mel Gibson. <laughs> you can see that though, right? Yeah, you can. <laughs> M- Mel Gibson. Yeah. Uh, Al Pacino. No. Uh, Richard Dean Anderson. Don't know who that is. Uh, that was MacGyver. Yeah. You oh, no. It. MacGyver? No. Okay. 
when did you last watch MacGyver? Or or Stargate. Because he's totally different in MacGyver than he is in Stargate. SG-1. I, I don't think I ever yeah. watched MacGyver, just Stargate. Because in MacGyver, he was a much different character than he was in Stargate SG-1. He, in okay. Stargate SG-1, he was very much military guy. But, but in MacGyver, he was a charming dude. He, he, he kind of came across as the everyman. He was what, uh, just an engineer who With a mullet. fought crime. <laughs> With a mullet. I, I don't think I can see around the mullet. No, right. <laughs> the problem. Uh, Tom Berenger. Uh, Michael Madsen. Nah. Uh-uh. Uh, John Travolta was considered no. for the role, uh-uh. no. but 20th Century uh, decided against it because he was considered a has-been at that time. <laughs> was considered. Yeah. It is a good now. <laughs> uh, fast running out of the options for the demographic data that the cinema score was helping to persuade the studio. The producers and director, uh, McTiernan, went to offer ro- the Will- Willis the role. Right and on. He got it. Well, so he was like, bottom of the barrel. Here you go. Let's try it. Well, he did a great job. And the studio at this point, like they didn't they didn't put the money into him being an action star. They put it into being an action movie so it could kind of take away from hey, here's this nobody that you've never heard of that we have no idea if he's gonna be able to pull this off. But it's an action movie and things go boom, so you'll like it. I thought he was light on his feet and moved well. No, yeah. I I mean, did you ever notice the uh the Hobbit feet? Yeah. The fake the fake feet. <laughs> I wanna talk about his uh shirt. How it became black? Yeah. It Sweat, slowly suit. gets, it starts as white and just becomes dark. It becomes a black. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a black, black tank top. Pants. Yeah. Yeah. He did donate the tank top, that blackened, bloody tank top in like 2012 to a, a film museum. You cannot touch it though. Like you can't go up and t- it's out in the open, I but can't touch a sweaty, apparently not <laughs> ancient corn syrup shirt. Oh no. <laughs> I want to talk about Argyle. Would anyone else have punched him in the nose on the ride to Nakatoma Plaza? Like, he was getting all up in his shit. Like, way beyond cabby. Yeah, he was a little, like, so no, 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 no. He, he, he would have punched him in the nose. <laughs> no, he, he wasn't a little. He was yeah. He was getting into personal realms. I, I, mean, I, I liked Argyle, but who I liked the, the most, I liked Theo, the, the computer technician. Oh, yeah, he was nice. Nah, man, Carl. Mm, which one carl. was carl carl was the was no the, no the cop cop the cop he's oh carl okay. in my brain the cop is oh, carl from family Al, matters Al oh, okay. yeah, yeah. No, it's carl he's carl he's carl of duty i like the the <laughs> oh god <laughs> oh my that was horrible come on he's he is carl winslow <laughs> i i like the crt touchscreen Mm-hmm. Oh God! Yeah. The his, future, yeah. Oh, but not just that, because it was so new. His reaction to it was just uh-huh. like, "You want to really? Yeah, <laughs> it'll help you take a piss if you need it." Wow. Okay. Thanks. I like how many people almost shot Alan Rickman in the back. Like there were MP5s pointed at his spine on like six occasions during this. No trigger discipline in this whole movie. Th- no, no muzzle man. discipline. No. No, I, I also kind of liked how they locked out all the elevators from the ground floor up to the 30th floor, and then they get in the elevators and take them up. I mean, like, they make a point of Theo yeah. showing that he's locking out all the elevators from the ground floor up, and then they get in the elevator and go. This is going to be tired and beating on a dead horse, but I Alan Rickman takes off his silencer to shoot in a, in a boardroom, and I just don't understand. Neither do I. It hurts so much. Tinnitus is real. The loud noises will make your ears bleed. Speaking of that, Bruce Willis actually suffered um, a partial um, hearing loss. Yeah. The part under the when he was under the desk, the producers uh, and the 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 stunt coordinator wanted it to be as realistic as possible, so they gave him heavy load blanks. Mm-hmm. And that close right there, as he fires up, it made him lose hearing in his left ear. Oh, yeah. So he said from now on, it has become a running joke in all of his movies. He can't really hear. So when he does say that that Bruce Willis what, that's him not being able to hear. He That was a good line, too. Remember mm-hmm. the line that the, the villain said, you know, if you get a shot, don't hesitate. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And he goes, <laughs> thanks for the advice or something <laughs> yeah. like that. Yeah. <laughs> There are a lot of really good little one-liners in this movie. There are a lot of really good little one-liners. I, I think, liked his, yeah. there's a lot of good physical acting, too. I like his good luck boobs poster that he kept he running kept, by. That, was, like, that was, kept touching. That's the <laughs> map, that was the map point. That was yeah. a save space in the game. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. <laughs> Man, what was it that, okay, another good throwaway line was when the two FBI agents were in the helicopter. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and Robert like, Dobby's like, this takes me back to Saigon. What about you? The other I guy's was in like, junior, junior high, high dickhead. dickhead. <laughs> 
Yeah, I have that but written down too. With such he didn't panache. even look back at him. He's just <laughs> like, yeah. Also, if I'm ever planning a heist, always, always, always bring backup detonators and backup C4. Any Boy Scout would know this. When mm-hmm. packing your C4. Yeah, don't hand him the throwaway henchman number one and then send him to go kill yeah, the hero. <laughs> if you don't know the guy's name, he's not going to make it. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah. So also, uh, m- most of all of the German that's being spoken in this movie is not real German, obviously. Yeah. It's I, all I like guess just not. guttural speaking that just yeah. kind of like made, they made it sound German. Now in, in <laughs> Germany, because there was some, there was some political unrest going on at the time, uh, in the German government, they had to change a lot of things for the German version. The German born they ter- in things. <laughs> the German born terrorists were changed into English forms, mostly into their British equivalents. Like Hans became Jack, uh, Carl became wait, wait, Charlie. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Let's go over that again. <laughs> so we America changed the Germans into British people to play in Germany. No, 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 no. No, when the German version of this movie came out the backgrounds and everything had to be changed a little bit, like going into being able to be played in Germany, things had to be changed. So it was no longer Hans Gruber. It was Jack Gruber. It's kind of like if you today, if you do a movie, this just sounds like this, we're trying to get them to fight England again. To no, me. no, <laughs> it's, it, it, it's, it's very close to like today. If you like when Valkyrie was filmed in Germany, they had to get very specific permission to be able to, to, to show Nazi regalia. Like it's not permitted. So some things had to be changed because there was going on. There was, um, the, the red army faction, there was German terrorists, terrorists in, at that same time. So they needed to change some things. So Carl became Charlie Heinrich turned into Henry, uh, the new background depicted them as radical Irish activists. Oh yeah, they had gone freelance okay. and for profit rather than ideals. That also led to some odd plot holes through the it's movie. Very important that it's for profit, <laughs> Which not ideals. Led into we all know. you know Die Hard with a Vengeance, where Gruber is remembered as having been German, not Irish. Yeah. Wait, I haven't seen any of the sequels to Die Hard. Some no. of them are pretty good. Really? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, the the second it's, one it's worth it's worth a watch too. The second one's a little rough. Eh, yeah. But then the they make Samuel it to Jack- like five. Yeah, the one with Samuel Jackson is yeah, really good. It's pretty good. And then he gets as they go all the you, you, his, his daughters in one, his sons in another. So it, they're they're worth they're worth your time. Yeah, they are. Okay. All right. I'll, 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 I'll maybe. <laughs> McTiernan did have a, a cameo for, you know, the bear in the beginning that he grabs for his kid. Yeah. That's the bear that's in the hunt for an October that Jack Ryan <laughs> takes his kids. Same exact bear. <laughs> it's awesome. Yeah. I do like the the constant appearances of the bear in the rearview mirror. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was very nice. I also like that if when looked at through the proper lens, the whole moral of this story, the, the entire overarching part of the story is support your wife or the terrorists win. <laughs> Yeah, okay. you know, because none of this would have happened if he had just been a good family man and not been a shithead about her suddenly making more money than him. Support your wife. Yeah. Or the terrorists win. Why would none of this have happened? They make comment about it in the beginning when when Argyle is talking yeah. to him about, you know, what's going on with you and your wife. And he's just like, basically, she got a good job, came out here. He had a backlog. He didn't want to follow her. Okay. It was his pride in like, hey, my wife is making more money than me. I'm not going to follow her. So I'm going to Oh, no, give- wait, I have it backwards. If you don't support your wife, then none of this happens. Wait. If I'm he getting had this supported his somehow. wife, if he had supported his wife, he and probably gone not, out to LA would not have been there. And gone to be an L.A. cop. Well, he would have been there because yeah, he would okay, have been living maybe, out there yeah. and she would have invited him to the, the party and he would have would been there. still have done their thing. They, that had no... I just like the yeah. phrase, support your wife or the terrorists yeah. win. I'm, 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 I'm going to roll with, with that, that yeah. mate. I'm, I'm a shirt with that. I, I love his hate during this whole thing. One, one thing I've always loved about Bruce Willis is he always does angry really yeah, well. Yeah, he does. Or he's like, fuck, you know. You should have punched, heard your brother punch, <laughs> fucking, fucking squeal punch when I broke his punch, fucking neck punch. No, no I like that the, the other one he did was he's like, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to cut you. I'm going to gut you. And yeah. I'm going to eat you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. I like trying that. To hey, Roy, you. how you feeling? Pretty fucking underappreciated, pal. <laughs> <laughs> the line that Hans booby. That was ad libbed by uh, Hart I was Bachner. so glad when he died. Yeah, and that and and so Rickman's like puzzled look was like 
I don't know where you're going with this ad lib. So he was <laughs> like, I don't know what this is all about. And, uh, the, he's a classical trained actor. He has no idea what this booby. That that was I like that. It's like the, the, the whole part where he's where they're talking about, you know, where he says, you know, when Alexander saw the the breath of his world, he, you know, he wept because there was nothing else to conquer. I like that line of like, you know, the 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 benefits of a classical education. Yeah, yeah. Bruce Willis had admitted that the Yippie Kaye motherfucker with that like yeah. perfect line from the movie was really just a joke. It was a throwaway. He was trying to crack up the crew. <laughs> Like in between takes, but the camera was still rolling, so they kept it in. And it is now a running thing. Yeah. That and elevators are a running thing in every single Die Hard movie. The only other thing that I can remember as like an iconic Bruce Willis action movie moment is, if I survive this, I'm going to dance a jig. You know, it's from The Last Boy Scout. Mm, oh, that's a good yeah. movie. Yeah. yeah. I really like Takagi. I like that character. He was a great, the the boss of Nakatomi, the, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. boss, yeah. And he had he had a, a a backstory apparently that went into it, but they didn't really get it. It was it was cut out. He had served on the on a on the Japanese Navy ship, the Akagi, which is noted. Wait, didn't uh, Hans Gruber narrate all of that aloud as he was looking for him? Well, I think as yeah. they were going through the model room, some of the backstory got yeah, told. but it wasn't like there was more of a backstory that, that okay. was cut out. I know there was a yeah. significant part where he's walking yeah, through looking for done. Akagi, and he's basically telling the man's life story. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but he was uh, he was on the Akagi, which later ended up being the password that you see on the computer that they cracked through, being Red Castle. And that was the carrier that transported the bombers uh, of Pearl Harbor in World War Two. So that was the, the the password that was used. Pearl Harbor, you say? Yes. Interesting. Yes. And now he's doing nice real estate to, to <laughs> something else we were talking about in a bit. Mm -hmm. uh... <laughs> you want to hear some funny things? Yeah. I do. The phrase "die hard." All right does not really translate in other countries. <laughs> so it was retitled in a number of countries. Okay, this I actually do want to hear. What do you got? In Spain, it's called the Crystal Jungle. Okay, dumb. And in Fuck Poland, you, it's called the Glass Trap because all the glass that he gets, you know, shot at. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. The movie title in Portugal is, uh, which I'm not even going to attempt that, but it translates into Skyscraper Heist. Why not just Hard to Kill? While I mean, the Hungarian title is... Movie. The Hungarian title is Give Your Life Expensive. The title of the no, sequel. No, I, I get that. That's like, you know. Yeah, the sequel being Your Life is More Expensive. And <laughs> the third one, The Life is Always Expensive. In Finnish, the movie title is Die Hard. Uh, and then it has like something I cannot even begin to pronounce, which literally translates I, I like that only the Finns, over my dead body. I like that the Finns got... Yeah, it's, it's, right. it's, yeah, it's die hard. Hey, they're brutal people. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I am going to attempt it. It's die hard vein Kuolian rumini ili, which apparently translates. We just lost Finland, y'all. <laughs> only over my dead body. Yeah, that's how the Finns fucking do it. Die hard, only over my dead body. I like that. Hakapal, motherfucker. <laughs> We're going to need more FBI guys, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> the budget was an estimated $28 million, which in 1988, 1987, that was a considerable amount. Opening weekend, though, it saw a paltry $600,000. That was it. They should have done it during Christmas. Yeah, uh, but what about its gross the, USA the run? made $83 million, Okay. And worldwide gross made $140 million. So it did make it back. It made it, you know, significantly. Yes. Well, it made it back enough to have how many fucking sequels? I think there's five, five, at five now. Okay, yeah. I think I believe. Die harder. Live for your die hard. Die hard. Yeah, with a, a good day to die hard. Good day to die hard. I mean, a you good can day play not with to that die. Name. Yeah, <laughs> something like that. Yeah. What else you got for us, Dusty? The cinematographer for this movie has been one of my favorites. He's done a number of movies that I really like, and you can see a lot of his same traits. Uh, Jean Demont. Uh, DeBont, sorry, excuse me. He did Speed, The Haunting, Minority Report, Twisters, which is one I like, Flatliners, Basic Instinct. You can see, almost see Helen Hunt's nipples in yes, Twister. Yes, you, you almost can. That was all right. And The Hunt for Red October, one of my other favorite movies. Some things in here don't react too well to bullets. I made a comment earlier that I could I could bring back one of your favorite movies, Robin Hood, into this. So You'll pay for that. I know. Uh, Michael Kamen, who did the music composition, uh, the score uh, for this movie. He did also X-Men, What Dreams May Come, 
He's obviously come a long way because I remember thinking that this score was really primitive. Uh, yes, Iron Giant, Event Horizon, Don Juan DeMarco, The Lethal Weapon series, and Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. Am I the only one who liked Don Juan DeMarco? I liked it. That was a good movie. Yeah. yeah. Again, another Brian Adams soundtrack movie. Unfortunately, yes, but... And it's Alpha <laughs> One and Alpha <laughs> Love. I refuse to join in on that solidarity. <laughs> <laughs> But also well, the other thing I liked musically for this movie, the suggestion of the director, uh, he wanted to use Beethoven's Ode to Joy. Yeah, that was uh, beautiful. That as was the musical beautiful. theme for the terrace. Yes, yeah. I love that. Uh, Gruber, the terrace leader, he even hums it at one point in the movie while uh-huh. he's on the, uh, on, the, on the elevator. But the composer at first thought it was sacrilege to use uh, Beethoven in an action movie telling McTiernan, quote, I will make mincemeat out of Wagner or Strauss for you, but why Beethoven? And McTiernan replied that Ode it's to Joy... It's not like it was Brahms. Yeah. I mean, it's not like it was something good. He had replied that Ode to Joy had been the theme to ultraviolence in Kubrick's uh, Clockwork Orange. And uh, at that point, Cameron, who was also a huge Kubrick fan, agreed to using Beethoven in this movie. And I think it was perfect for this whole that movie. That was a great scene when they finally break into the vault and yeah. it starts oh my God. playing. Yes. Yeah, we were cackling with joy. And all the $100,000 bonds just laying around. And they're Bearer bonds. Ugh. Ugh. Bearer bonds. Now, so, if I remember that, that means you don't have to show any ID. You just no, turn you it just in. cash it. It's yeah, whoever you holds count. it in their hand yep. owns it. What else you got for us? Anything? What, any, was your any, fav- what was your favorite part of the movie? My favorite part of the movie, honestly. Oh, God. And I just watched I got show one last if night. you want to think yeah, for you a go second. For it. Okay. So there's a moment, uh, probably like the second firefight scene, where uh, Bruce Willis does this amazing bit of uh, physical acting and it's him and I know it's him because I can see his fucking face it's not it's not a stunt double he's running he's being shot at glass walls are exploding as he's passing them right and he does this weird thing where he hits the end of his stride bounces just a little bit in the air and changes direction by 90 degrees so he's he's running full tilt glass is blowing and he boom, boom, into a room and it was that's really hard to do and I imagine so. I was like, and it, it's it's very much a John Everyman move. He's not going, ha ha! I took the bullets and I shoot you because I can shoot like a laser. <laughs> he's he's running, he's hiding, and he is bouncing around like a deer. And you only get to move like that when you're terrified. The, the your your fighter adre- fighters kicked your, in. Your adrenaline has kicked, and you are running for your life. And he did that, and he did it so well, and it, it was wonderful, and I loved it. I got it. Okay, my favorite movie. My favorite movie. My favorite. Part is when Carl of Duty is the 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 corpse falls onto his car and he <laughs> puts that shit it. in reverse <laughs> and he's like fuck that what fuck oh god just that whole flight where he's being fired upon and he's mm-hmm. screaming at yeah. the thing and he just like knocks that shit off of the road it was it was a beautiful scene it I also... reminded me a lot of it was the opposite of the uh taking this back to one of our first movies sneakers when the blind guy's driving and he's just yeah. driving over everything <laughs> it was like that in reverse it was beautiful i i will say i missed one other thing i really liked and that was at the very end where he uh he he shoots where, where uh the cop shoots yeah and and kills the guy who who got the drop on him um i like that the the other his his arc as an lapd officer <laughs> is learning to kill again because that's a very LAPD thing. Yeah, it is. It's like, you got it, buddy. You're back. You can kill people again. Well, this time he killed the right person. It, well, yeah. yeah. And and initially, uh, there wasn't any kind of major character development for the cop, for um, it, It's a very Ellis, mini arc. Yeah. It feels tacked on, but I, I really you know, it, it. It does, but Bruce Willis apparently became so exhausted during filming this movie they had to stretch out, so they did give more of a background to some of those characters. So yeah. that's why you get more of the cop, why you get more of Ellis, more of his wife, so on. What's yours, Dusty? A one-liner that I love is the, it, well, the police have not to have themselves an RV. I like, I like that whole setup. I like that. I think my favorite little scene, there's two actually, him crawling through the duct and with the lighter, you know, come mm-hmm. out to the coast, we get together, we'll have a few laughs. And then I like when when he was fighting the the blonde guy, 
uh, you know, where he was saying, you know, I'm going to cut you, I'm going to gut you, and I'm going to eat you. I, just, I, I agree with you on that, Dusty. I love his fucking rage. He's just, <laughs> he's pissed. He's, he's a human animal who has gotten rid of all that societal bullshit, and he just wants to kill. And I love that. I also really liked the existence of uh, Chekhov's CB radio. The very beginning of the movie, he's in the car. And the guy's telling him all about the features of the limo. It's like, yeah, I just got this thing. It's got all this sweet stuff. It's got this. It's got this. It's got CB radio. And then that line is used to tie that character back into the story later yeah. when he's having his own little private party with the stuffed bear. And he watches that shit on, right on the television. And he turns, he reaches over, turns on the CB radio, and it's back into it. And yeah. it, I thought that was a nice callback. One thing, can you imagine, just, I'm watching the movie and I'm like, I see this one little bit. My brain goes, God, that would be fucking expensive. Can you imagine the phone bill on that cell phone? Because he was talking to his girlfriend from like. That's not dusk. a cell phone. That's a, a car, car phone. Car phone, mobile phone. Okay. From dusk until dawn, pretty much. And at like three bucks a minute at that point in time, that was an expensive phone call. Yeah. Yeah. I, and that was all on John McClane's bill. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'd like to say that I love living in the future. I really do because I, I come from the analog area. I think we all do. Yeah. And I, I, I just, I love the period of time that we live in right now. I, I didn't get my flying car, but that's okay because I have something smarter than Hal in my pocket, which is slowly irradiating my testicles every time <laughs> I walk and erasing the magnetic strip on my bank card. But that's neither here nor there. I remember keeping. Um, a deposit book. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't do that. I use my thumbprint to instantly check my bank. I mean, I, I, I remember I love keeping a living in the future. I remember keeping a book of everyone's yeah. addresses and yeah. phone numbers. And I and I love so much watching old movies and going, ah, that's what they see for the future. I love that. It's <laughs> so good. Did you happen to notice how many Twinkies he bought? Fucking a most of a bag full. Did you happen to know how much how much he laid down to pay for those? I did not. Only three one dollar bills. That bought like God 20 bless fucking America. cookies and the gas was only like 77 cents a gallon for like high end. I did like that moment where Al Young is covering the door and he's sitting there and he's got that strategic position ready to fire out and he looks down and there's the candy. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. He takes the crunch Watch bar. <laughs> yep. And then a Mars bar later on. That, that, yeah. That's why That's why I said I think he was scarier in Big Trouble in Little China. I agree. he wasn't sneaking candy. I, that's, that was just, to me, one of many moments of Humanizing comedy. moments. Comedy. Yeah. yeah. Humanizing, but also comedic. Like, it wasn't just all action all the time. This is what and I'm always saying. It need to be a joke. Villains aren't necessarily villains all the yeah, time. That's exactly. just what I'm saying. I mean, he was just getting paid. Yeah. yeah. I got 50 bucks on this game. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Huey Lewis, not Huey Lewis, Huey Lewis. Yeah. Honestly, like when I was watching it again, I couldn't tell the physical difference between the first security guard and the yeah, <laughs> and the one doing it. It's like, wait, did they just shoot him and replace it with the same guy? <laughs> Everybody in I, the eighties looks the same to me. <laughs> once I see the wire frame glasses and a mustache, my, my I have them logged. It just turns off. They could be anyone at that yeah. point. Yeah, I think it's much. funny though. Now, if this movie were, were to be redone, if it would be completely rebooted. Those guys wouldn't like everything would have to be shut down before they even walk through the lobby door because you'd be like, oh, look at all the, the security cameras. Everything would be going on. I, I think I know who to cast, though. And and if we were to do it today, it's it's uh, it's the Pratt. Well, let's talk about that when we get to the characters a little bit deeper in our next okay. section, because that's a good yeah. that's a good segue. Do you get anything more for the movie section before we take this to the table? I think we should take it to the table. Let's do it. All right. Hi, this is Matthew. Thanks for listening. We wanted to take a moment to talk to you about uh, one of our sponsors, Guardian Games. Guardian Games has been with us since the very beginning of this show. Guardian Games is Portland's premier game store. They have magic miniatures, shelves and shelves and shelves and shelves of RPGs, all the gaming swag, anything you could possibly want for your gaming experience. If you're ever in Portland and looking for a gaming store, Guardian Games is the biggest, most diverse store in Portland. You definitely owe it to yourself to go to Guardian Games. Tell us about these characters, Dusty. All right. So we have the star of the show, Mr. Bruce Willis, as John McClane, the streetwise New York cop who come to L.A. to reconcile with his wife. And if you don't know who Bruce Willis is, 
go look up IMDb. Okay. <laughs> oh, by the way, there's spoilers in this. Yeah. Just so you know. Most of the most of these actors, <laughs> most of these actors, I think a- actors and actors, everybody knows at this point. Okay. So, really? Who is she? Bonnie Bedelia? Yeah. She's been in a few movies. Uh, <laughs> actors and actresses. <laughs> that 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 is how you do it, Dusty. I love it. <laughs> okay. So Bruce Willis, John McClane. Mm-hmm. A chaotic good. Yeah. Why not walk? Come on. No, he he everything yeah, was chaotic. I haven't stated I haven't chaotic. stated my case, but why not waffle? Because he would have played by the rules, like ultimate rules. He would have yeah, they were following a playbook outside that he yeah, wasn't no. particularly interested hold on, hold in following. Hold on, hold on. What playbook though? Okay. First off, the FBI? okay, guys, guys, let's let's break this down. Well, first, you know what? first of all, actually, yeah, hang no, on. There's I'll give it, yeah, absolutely. There's, yes. there's something that that I, I have yeah. a, there is a big problem that I have with this movie yeah. that I didn't talk about the first part of it. So he's going up the flight of stairs towards the top of the building. Yes. Why wouldn't you just try to go down the 30 flights of stairs, get to the bottom floor, shoot the guy that's at the at, at the reception, and make a fucking phone call for the cops to show up at that point? Great question. Because your wife's in the building. Okay, good point. I didn't think about that. I had the same question, and then I forgot it. <laughs> also, <laughs> now again, I have it again. your wife's in the you building. just answered it. So, good job. Chaotic good. I'll get with that. For some reason, I was like... <sighs> I feel that the more we drink, the more that we change what we believe <laughs> that each of the alignments means. But I'm going to go with that because he did basically fuck off cops. I'm yeah. going to do this my own way. Like literally yeah. the enforcement tools of law said no to. So, yeah, yeah no. Like he was literally told no by the law. And he's like, well, no, yeah. I keep doing my thing. And the FBI were like, do it. No, I don't think the FBI ever communicated with him. No, but they communicated. At him through the others. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, he shot at him. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have Alan Rickman as Hans Gruber, the German mastermind and leader of oh, wait, the... Wait, wait, wait. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's say that back. Now, here's, here's, here's where back. we get interesting. You're right, because we've been drinking, so I'm ready for this. Uh-huh. Who would you cast in the remake? Wait, the remake's already been redone. It, it, no, 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 it, no. it was called Skyscraper with The Rock, and it was horrible. No, no, no. Um, Who from, would you from, cast? From Parks and Rec. Uh, Chris Pratt. Chris Pratt? Mm-hmm. I can see it. Yeah, mm-hmm. totally. He's he's charming. Yeah, he's, he's he's fucking funny. He does one-liners. He's not like handsome or anything. He's kind of goofy looking. Yeah. Okay, but you know he's he's decently enough built to play an action star as we see in God- Guardians of the Galaxy. I'm good with it. Yeah, yeah. I like it. Hmm. I'd go with Bradley Cooper. I could see either of them doing it. I think Bradley yeah. Cooper would be would be better. I think he's a better straight man. I think Chris Pratt would make everything too much of a joke. I think they both have the sarcasm and the wit, but I think Bradley Cooper, it wouldn't be so much of a joke as it would with Chris Pratt. I could see either one of them. I agree with both of you. Right. Yeah. And then we have Alan Rickman as Hans Gruber, the German mastermind. Uh, neutral evil. He, he is, was following a playbook, though. He, he didn't give a step fuck. Step by step. He did not give a fuck about anyone else there. He was simply there to make money for himself. Lawful. He, Lawful. He was following step by step. Every he said, "There's a timetable to this. The FBI will kick in their play." Look, We're ha- having having a exa- spreadsheet doesn't mean that you're uh, yeah that that <laughs> <laughs> that you're lawful. Neutral evil people can be organized. organized yeah, yeah. I mean, it matters uh, the, why. The way you're I doing always it. look at it, Dusty, yeah. is um, the mores of your culture. Like, are are you obeying the precepts of your culture? Mm-hmm. Whereas John McClane wasn't because he was a cop. He, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. I like this. All right, all right. Because all right. we we get back to the whole sneakers thing. Because I I think he was obeying the precepts of his culture. Okay, so. I can I can go with that. All right. So who would you cast in a new Die Hard as Hans? Well, hold on, neutral evil Matthew. Because oh. he wasn't chaotic. He still had. He was. He never lost his grip. Really, he's he still had a was functioning i'd say chaotic neutral actually I, I wouldn't say evil why he wanted the money america i mean and, and he was stealing it from well, let's be honest here a real estate developer it's not like it's he true. went to the orphans and grannies home and stole their money he stole it from an la real estate developer he was willing to just flippantly murder people again the civilians uh, not no 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 threats. he was Willing to kill real estate developers. <laughs> Whatever. Okay, who would you cast? <laughs> uh, no, I'm going chaotic neutral. Um, okay. I would who would I Joker. cast? Wow. Um, okay. I don't know. I haven't seen a good villain in a while come out. 
I really haven't. Um, maybe Benedict. What about Sam Neill? No, no, he's too old now. Christian Bale. No, I'll, well. I'll go with Benedict Cumberbatch. Yeah, I Benedict think he could do a, a really yeah. good That's villain. Br- yes. Yeah. He does a really good villain. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. yeah. I could also see Christian Bale. Engelbert Humperdinck. Off. Definitely. <laughs> All right. <laughs> then we have Alexander uh, Gudnov as Carl, the uh, Han's main henchman. The blonde one who yeah, loses his, uh, who has the stire? Yeah. Okay. I never, I didn't really, I didn't know what kind of gun that was. I think it's a stire. Is it just a twenty two? No, it's a, it's a stire. I don't know what a stire is. It was the gun of villains in 80s action movies. Okay, like, that I remember. It's weird. Yeah. It looks European. Because it it's looks got like it was... weird bullpup design. Yeah, because it looks like it was, it was like its cousin was on Stargate SG-1. Yeah. Okay. Um, th- this is, it's a bullshit shit gun. But, okay. All right. Uh, the MP5s are way better. The ones that the everyone else is Speaking running around Speaking of which, with. I have a machine gun now. Ho, ho, ho. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was great. <laughs> I have... <laughs> I have a question. You fire guns way more than I do, yes. at least I think. So how come in, and it might just be just for movie magic, but how come in movies, whenever, like, we'll take the, the shorter haired blonde guy that he that was killed in, in the beginning where he got the machine gun from, yeah. right? Okay. As he's creeping up on McLean, he like hits the top of the barrel of the gun. So there's like a snapping sound. But oh, that's that's to make the snapping sound. Okay, I was like, it doesn't seem like there's any functionality he, to like no, he, do anything with it. The, the fucking charging that, is yeah. on the side of that. Yeah. I mean, I don't. I mean, know I can understand. Why. If he took the clip out and put magazine. It, magazine. Excuse me. Thank you. I always get him flipped. Take the magazine out, hammer it up inside. I get that, but just like you know, slapping the top of the barrel, I don't understand. And I there, see there's it in a lot of no '80s movies, like Schwarzenegger did it, Stallone did it. Why do you think he died first? Yeah, he fucking gave his position away yeah. by slapping the barrel. Dumbass. Yeah. All right. So yeah, Carl, no, th- there is no reason for that. Okay. Carl, chaotic hench- henchman. Yeah. Yeah. Like henchman. He's just everybody else cool. now is pretty much henchman. And no, I disagree. Uh, we have a cop. All right, we'll get to him. Um, then we have Bonnie Bedelia as the estranged wife, Holly Gennaro McLean. Generic McLean. I'd say lawful yeah. good. Yeah. 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 Yeah, sure. There was not a only moment. that. I mean, and she was she was good. I mean, she her charge. her actions were good. She was uh, putting herself at personal risk to gain benefits for the prisoners, and uh, told her her uh, husband who was trying to like piss down her career to go fuck himself. So I mean, yeah, I lawful good. Then we go to Reginald Vell Johnson as Sergeant Al Powell. Lawful good. Yeah. Yeah. But not 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 of not of the paladin quality, more of the I'm doing my job more, quality. More, more of the, the priest quality because he had lost his way. A Tony shot yeah. a kid. I mean he's But he was still trying to do good and he was still trying to be a cop and still trying to uphold the law. He didn't really agree with the tactics of his superior officer, but at the same time he didn't like straight out slug him or anything no. he stuck around and kept the peace so yeah I'll, i mean i'll go lawful good but it's more like lawful bitch he had a good heart <laughs> yeah, i guess he shot I mean, that dude at the end he was poisoning yeah. his wife with all those twinkies <laughs> he even gave a list of what was in him <laughs> so Fucking yeah diabetes what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> and then we playing have- him today would be uh oh god if we wanted to like match size and everything who's that keenan uh Key and, Key and Peel? No, no, the guy from. Uh, no, good that Burger. would be really good, actually. <laughs> oh, you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. What, yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. The guy from Key and Peel would be. Yeah, good, he would but, be uh, fantastic okay. in that role. But I think the guy from Good Burger, he was on Saturday Night Live for a while. I think. Oh, I know who you're talking about. I don't yeah. remember his name though. Yeah. Okay. I can never remember his name. The the bigger kid. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, That's again, if we want like a chubby black dude, yeah. who's a good actor. Yeah. Then we have Paul Gleason, who played Dwayne T. Robinson, the deputy chief of police, who always plays a massive dickhead yeah. in every movie he's in. And he's still um, alive? I think he died. I think he well, if he's still died alive, let's get of, him back. Yeah. <laughs> a number of years he's ago He's about perfect. Now, you were looking for a role for Richard Gere earlier. I think yeah. he, would, he would fill yeah. that role yeah, well. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> uh, he would. I mean, he's, he's, he's about of that age now, or at least he looks like that with all the plastic surgery. It's true. He's got the same haircut. Parted on the side, swept. I mean, it's, it's the same guy. I mean, really. you could play the role up for a little bit more laughs and make it, uh, what's his name? Um, the guy who played uh, J. Jonah Jameson in the <laughs> Spider-Man movie. No. Uh, <laughs> he was so good. <laughs> yeah. The guy in the, the Sam Raimi Spider-Man yeah, 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 movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 
God, that guy was great. <laughs> Looked just like him, too. <laughs> and then we move on to uh, Devereaux White, who played Argyle. Ugh, God, driver. NPC. Yeah, totally I mean, and, NPC. Yeah, I have no idea who to cast yeah. in that role. Uh, Some then we, young dude. Then we have William Atherton, who played Richard Thornburg, the arrogant reporter. That role no, might as well wait, not wait, have wait. existed. Hannibal Burris would play him. Who is he? He's uh, he's a comedian. He would he would play the, the uh, Argyle perfectly. Okay. <laughs> okay. I, I know I know he's an NPC, but Hannibal's fucking cool. And uh, let's see, we have Clarence Gilliard who played Theo, the tech specialist. Cancel that. That's where Hannibal goes. Okay. <laughs> uh, also an NPC. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. Lawful, the, the, lawful the, neutral. Yeah. The, the next two people are NPCs, and we hey, have most of the people that we're naming now. We're getting into are going to be characters that the hero never actually interacts with. Yeah. yeah. And then yeah. we have Hart Botchner who played Ellis, the coked out executive. Quest giver, yeah, Don quest giver, quest. Quest. Yeah. and then James yeah. Shigata, uh, who played T- Takagi, the head executive. Uh, plot device, yeah, not, yeah not plot a, device. Yeah. Yep, pretty much. All right, that rounds. I pick the dad, the guy who played the dad, uh, Heroes Dad in uh, Heroes. I never watched Heroes. The, oh wait, that was George Takei. I'd put George Takei okay. in that role. Okay. Yes, I would put George Takei, George Takei in a number of roles. Yeah. Mm-hmm. God bless that man. Or um oh who was he uh he was in the the most recent reboot of the Godzilla movies um Shit, Matthew but, Broderick no not that <laughs> no is he still alive yes he is when he dies I know I know that uh, I'm gonna Takeshi, have to start seeing the Doctor uh, Takeshi regularly. Kitano K- Takeshi Kitano we'd put him in it yeah he's a iconic Japanese actor All right yeah um I I would put yeah. uh oh th- that's his name Ken Watanabe. Yeah, Ken Watanabe. Watanabe. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, he would be good as well. I, I think that's about it, though. Yep. I don't yeah. think there was anyone. There's else. no. That's we've yeah, named. I, cut, I think everyone I cut, in the movie with the speaking part. Yeah, I cut Except a for lot the sewer of the, guy. Yeah, <laughs> I cut a lot out from that. <laughs> that guy's too. like, I could just do it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's I a comedian. Just... That was Rick Dukerman. I he was a don't comedian know who from that the is, 80s. But have you ever seen The Burbs with Tom Hanks? Long time. That was his next door neighbor best friend. Okay. So, yeah, I could do. I I I can do it right here. I got it. It's really no trouble. All right. Well, let's actually make a game out of this. All right. So, okay. as we normally do, sometimes you have a story for us to follow this up with, Matthew. You know, this one, there's already so many sequels. There's a whole campaign. Just play the next movie. The next movie? Yeah. Die so, Hard 2. Die Hard 2. Isn't that Die the Hard one that's the exact same thing as Die Hard 1, but at an uh, airport? Yep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then there's Die Hard 3. Die, yep, <laughs> Die Hard 3, and then Die Hard 4, and... Die Hard five. five, yeah. Die Hard six. Um, in in the case of standalones, I'll go ahead and uh, and do that. But on this one, just just play the movies. You you have years worth of campaigns. Yeah, in the movies. you do. Well, let's talk about this as a gameable source of inspiration, and let's break down the themes of this movie. Humor, um, humor, humor. Mm-hmm. You think humor is important to a game like this? Absolutely. Well, I agree. I agree. Yeah, you need humor in this, but you don't want to comedic game but you do want a game that you want will snark you want some snark you want a little bit of snark no slapstick slapstick kind of breaks the tension of it but something that ha- allows you to have those moments of quotable gaming humor that isn't just like you know yeah the stuff you remember from campaigns years and years and years ago well, I mean, every gaming group, regardless of whatever the fuck you're playing, be it a horror game or a D&D game. Nick turned into a tree. It was the final battle, brother. You turned into a fucking tree. <laughs> fuck your druid. I was going to say, this is the druid story, isn't it? God damn it, Nick. <laughs> you're going to have an infinite source of quotes to draw on for the rest of your life. And uh, again, any game can pull that off, but you want to be able to play a game that doesn't take itself so seriously that you can't do it. I'm sorry. I know he listens to the podcast and I just had to bust his balls live. <laughs> you also have the theme of a character who is, you are the hero. This is, again, as it is with many of the movies that we do, that you're going up against grand opposition, but you want to be able to have your player, because there's, it's diehard, it's one person, it's a cat and mouse game, there's one player. You can kind of do it with a group, but right now we're just going to assume your player, you want your player to feel that they have a chance. Even if they take an everyman character, you want to be able to bring forth that that feeling of against all odds, I still might succeed if I just do X. 
thing is uh, about an everyman is that uh, one of the things that we often forget when we're playing these type of games is that a human is a pretty capable critter, even without superpowers or magic or skill trees. A human is capable of insane feats under pressure. And that, that I think that's the charm of the everyman character. So yeah, t- definitely something that that highlights that. And you, you want to bring that to your game too. You want to make the damage real, I think is very important to to playing this. It's not, all right, scratch off two hit points. It's okay, so... You just got shot in the in the leg and you can't walk. Well, yeah, it's not that. It's like, all right, well, I'm going to sprint across the room. Well, it's fucking broken glass. Well, they're coming in on me with a gun. Well, you have a choice to make now, don't you? <laughs> you <know? laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, you if you wanted to play a more narrative game, that right there just represents you. Oh, I'm going to do this. And the GM throws a thing at you, throws an obstacle, and you throw a counter obstacle, and then they throw an obstacle. None of that even requires dice. Yeah. That's like we did with Wushu, where it's just like I state a thing, and then you state a thing, and then I state a thing. And eventually, mm-hmm. whoever says, all right, just fucking roll for it okay, well, I have this, but I'm working against this and I have this and I'm working against mm -hmm. this and I have this and I'm working against this. Now I know my my target and my obstacles. That that could work. This is the kind of game where it's, I mean, seriously, you could play a game like this, like just have a deck of cards (laughs) and like flip a card and see what happens kind of thing. Because, you know, you're going to run out at some point. do have to be stacked in some form or fashion with the, the PC though, because the DM or the game master or whatever, storyteller, literally has all the power they're outgunned they are outsmarted they are outplanned but somehow in order especially if it's it's a one player character game you are you as as the guy running it are putting this forward for their benefit not just to kill off your friend unless you're a complete dick (laughs) this is definitely going to be a one-shot kind of game yeah it's it's rare that i've seen gm plus one player games last more than a single session usually they are something that you either play with somebody you know this is our date night game that we play for whatever or reason just to intro them into yeah a group or a system this is not going to be a campaign therefore you don't have to worry about experience you don't have to worry about leveling you don't have to worry about gaining advancement to worry about having i would fun. like to say in this one certain specific case there's no palladium game that works well <laughs> Oh, dear Lord. Thank you, NPC. <laughs> There's really Since not, Since it's though. a one shot, there might be. There could be. The, even. There's not. Sorry. There's no. not. There's not. <laughs> I thank I, you for trying. I can't. There's I, not. I just can't. There's, yeah, there's that, no that Palladium game that I could imagine <laughs> that would do this. Unless you just wanted to run straight up Ninjas and Super Spies. Maybe. He's but, either. Yeah. Or Heroes Unlimited. Heroes still, Unlimited. Still neither. Ah, but Heroes Unlimited allows for a versatile array of characters, including yeah, but there, it's a, a super, commoner. It, it's, yeah, but, yeah, so does D&D. What about, but, what, I mean, it's, it, that's a supers game. Similarly, then, what about Mutants and Masterminds? You could, you it, could, essentially, you could posit that, that he has, like, yeah. super strength or quickness. Honestly, th- this, this is a more, and I rarely say this, because mm-hmm. I, I love my dice. Yeah. Th- this one's a narrative game. Uh, oh, with with, with only the, the big moments being decided by any kind of random generation. Oh, I'd the, be game for that. Yeah, this one is story back and forth. Well, something that we have to consider, and I don't think we've ever actually said this before, but something that we do have to consider and we should consider going forward is that any game that you bring to the table, because of the fact that you're playing a game and not watching a movie, there needs to be a chance of failure. So you need to be prepared for the eventuality that John McClane might lose. You know, you need to play a game. Yeah, he might not save the day. If he might not save the day, and if if because if he's destined to save the day, what's the point of playing the game? And that, it's no longer a game at that point. It's just us sitting around telling a getting high and telling what would be cool if we did this kind of story. Have movies will game does not endorse getting high. It's Oregon. You can get high all you <laughs> want. <laughs> And if you're not in Oregon, you should come to Oregon <laughs> and get high. Or Washington actually, or Colorado. <laughs> I was or California. just going to say, actually, it's it's the West Coast now. I don't know what yeah. the rest of you fuckers are up to. Some but, sort of Dark Ages feudalism shit going on. Single player games can be tricky because they do require a different format. A lot of what you're going to be doing is, a, like you said, it's, it's more narrative. It's going to be more back and forth and back and forth. You're not going to, I mean, just single player D and D games. I'm sorry, they're fucking boring. It's just they're not designed that way. They're designed as a party game. It's not just combative. 
um, in the story itself, when you do a single player D and D or any traditional gaming style, it's it's combative between the the player and the DM. You're, yeah. you're trying to you're not crafting anything together. You're trying to outwit the person. So essentially, what a, down what yeah. a diehard inspired game would be is a cat and mouse game of one man against a villain. And that villain has a group of henchmen. And then the hero has to find a way to combat them one-on-one, whatever. Because, you know, the hero knows that the hero is outgunned because they are just one person. And there's no way for a player character to take a build-driven RPG and make their hero match to whatever's coming ahead. Because this is the kind of game where a GM is going to turn to the player and say... What kind of character do you want to play? Now, I'm going to build a scenario around that that you have to survive. So it could be John McClane going into a tower. It could be Steven Seagal on a boat. It could be. Fuck no. Who'd want to play that? (laughs) Who'd want to play that? I don't know. It could be any number of similar one against the terrorists kind of games. Fucking terrorists. You're terrorists. (laughs) So honestly, there's so many different systems that can pull this off that again it doesn't matter what your experience level is you just have to have uh an you array could, of stats you could that, even just break out some minis and some of your scenery pieces and then put a coin on the table and just flip it fuck you could just play he shoots him though no, he shoots that <laughs> you know it's yeah a good way to do it one-on-one gaming is kind of weird but there's ways to pull it off so i asked online I got some people to offer me some suggestions of games that they thought would work out. Uh, someone recommended Cyberpunk, the old school Cyberpunk. I, uh, I do have a buddy that played a, a Vampire the Masquerade one on one for like 12 years, I think. That's. Did they get married afterwards? No. Either sad and or, or dedicated <laughs> and or amazing. I don't. <laughs> I don't know how I feel about that. I would have to meet your friend wait, to wait, wait, ask wait, final wait, wait. judgment. I, all right. I, I know you're going somewhere, but I need to know more. Okay. Um, <laughs> 12 years? About, yeah. One one player, one mm-hmm. storyteller. One player, one storyteller. Were they LARPing at any no, time? No, they were not LARPing. Well, I mean, they were, no, they were not LARPing. They were, they did the tabletop version, but they were acting everything out. They were in character the entire time, but they were not dressed up as a standard LARPer. Were okay. they naked? I don't know. I wasn't there. <laughs> Sounds like it would be better if they were naked. <laughs> Most things are. Um, sure. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Did that? Did that quell your curiosity? Yeah, I was out. Okay. Right. So Dyson logo. And I'm going with sad. Dyson's <laughs> an accomplished mapper. Um, uh, he's an online friend of mine. Dyson recommended Cyberpunk. He says we ran similar scenarios in Cyberpunk over the years. Brutal gun combat, established stealth rules. However, I think a game that allows for degrees of stealth successes would be better for this. I've had a number of people recommend a game that we've mentioned before called Hollow Point. Oh, we yeah, brought this yeah. up on the good John stuff. Wick episode. Yeah. I think it would be good for John Wick. It could work with some manipulation for Die Hard. Again, it's more built for a team. I guess you could do one on one. I've never actually thought about that. Um, again, everybody, always someone recommends Fate. I actually have a good friend, one of our listeners, who would like to bring on as a guest for an episode to pitch a game that Fate would be perfect for, because I just can't talk about it. There's another game that came out recently. My buddy Eric Franklin recommended Blades in the Dark, says it could support this reasonably well. You'd want to flip the game, though. Cast the PCs as Hans Gruber and his team trying to pull off a heist yeah. while one annoying NPC does his best to be a fly. Yeah, I, agree with that. I was thinking that, too. Yeah, same here. And you will... And Eric are not alone in this because I had a number of other commenters recommend flipping the game around. Yes, that and would playing be so Hans. much fun to be the GM and just go. <laughs> fuck yeah, with it would. Yeah. All right, Bob, the elevator's there. All right, approach. <laughs> Holy fuck, it's Jimmy. <laughs> what does it say on his shirt? Ho. Oh, motherfucker. <laughs> That's my brava. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh. And, uh, Brebo Sheldon recommends Action Movie World, which you've talked about before and which I'd like to bring in. It's basically in a Powered by the Apocalypse game that's based on action movies. The <laughs> A number of people recommended Shadowrun specifically for that same template where a sa- mm-hmm. Shadowrun, Cyberpunk, D20, 
yeah, mutants and masterminds, any of well. that, Palladium, Ninjas, Super Spy could work yeah. if you're playing Hans Gruber and the team. Yeah? Yeah. No, I, I agree with that completely. Honestly, myself, if I was trying to do this from, from the McLean side with one person, I would literally do what I said. I would break out my miniatures and I'd draw some lines like, this is this floor. This is this floor. There's a coin. You shoot me, I shoot you. <laughs> you know? That, that's literally how I do it. <laughs> that, 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 that would be the rules. You know? You can move this far. Okay. Do you take his gun? And you have this many rounds. And yeah. you can do two actions. And yeah. yeah. like This would be really simple to do with no system. No system at all. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Where it's just like, I say this and you say this. Yeah. The constant level of one-up. Yeah. One-upsmanship is a fun fucking way to game, especially for two players. You know, you need to establish some rules, but, you know, whoever uh, whoever laughs first loses and takes a shot. Totally. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you could play this shit with Green Army men. I mean. <laughs> oh, wow. You could. <laughs> That's awesome. However, I'm pretty sure I have the perfect game for Die Hard. What and you I got? want to know Bring if either of you can guess what... I'm bringing to the table. I have He's referenced fate, it. right? No idea. No idea. Mm, no, no. Six shots in. Now, Robin D. Laws has uh, written a game that we've talked about, and it was the game of choice for our first episode. And that game is Feng Shui Two. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. I have but that. specifically, he wrote a supplement for it that was funded through backers, and people would submit different movies that they wanted him to write about. And he wrote this supplement called Blowing Up the Movies Feng Shui Style. And there's a section on Die Hard. Are you going to link this on the website? Oh, oh yeah. Okay. It's available for purchase on Drive Through RPG. There will be a link on there. I feel that this might be cheating going back to another game that we talked nah. about. But no, this we've game done it a couple perfect. of times. To emulate a cat and mouse scenario in Feng Shui. You first of all want to limit it to a solo effort. One PC against many villains. Once you have the full range of feng shui heroes on board, you aren't going to see them fleeing from mooks. So you might want to tune individual mooks upward, giving them attack values of 15. They still drop just as fast, but more than one of them at once becomes a threat that the hero must run from. You'll want a closed environment containing many sub-locations. Hollywood's love of Die Hard, let it, to long ago burn through every locational variant. Under siege is die hard on a boat. Speed is die hard on a bus. In pitch, if not fully in execution. Turning something familiar into an interactive gaming experience turns it fresh again. So you could go ahead and use any of those. Or the original Office Tower. Feng Shui's additional time periods come to your rescue here. Letting you do die hard in a pagoda. Die Hard in a Mutant-Filled Bunker. Die Hard in Chinese Hell. I'd play that one. Yeah, so would I. Pick a hero archetype without the mook sweeping powers of the killer, mass avenger, or swordsman. The Maverick Cop turned to tuned to take down featured foes and bosses with big damage becomes an underdog if pitted mostly against harder hitting mooks. The player might complain of having most of the archetype's key sticks nerfed by the nature of the opposition. Then say, Yep. Also, you're barefoot. Or whatever other visual symbol you use to evoke the hero's initial stage of complete disadvantage. And then just go from there. Yeah. You could. The movie did a great job of like completely stripping him from anything, him of all useful tools. <laughs> like barefoot, wearing a tank and some jeans. And that's that's it. He yeah. had no equipment. Slacks even. <laughs> yeah. He had nothing. Just his gun. That no. was it. Did yeah, he have a machine gun. gun? Yeah, he had his gun. Oh, okay. When he was in the bathroom when they first came up the elevator, he, he had his gun with him. Okay. Yeah. Right on. Gun's on a plane. Honestly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, his gun was on a plane. Don't worry, I'm a cop. <laughs> yeah. It's okay. Been doing it for 15 years. Yeah. It's okay. No, I, I could play this in Feng Shui. That's a good choice. Yeah, it is a good choice. Personally, I know Shadowrun better than almost any other game. I could run this as the Hans Gruber team in Shadowrun. I would prefer an older edition than the current one, but Shadowrun, you know, you create a team of operatives. You have the tech guy. You have the social guy who is Hans Gruber. You have uh, the bruiser, the gun, you know, the the head 
badass who is Carl. You have the A team only, you know, dark side. Yeah, yeah. And that's differently the motivated fun. side. Differently yes, this motivated. is true. <laughs> <laughs> you and your questionable alignment theories. <laughs> <sighs> so is that the game? Th- that's that's yeah, I think that wraps it. Yeah. Honestly, Feng Shui is where it's at. Yeah. Feng Shui is if I were to run a die hard game, I would I would definitely well, you know, <laughs> who would I run this with? I would pick one person and we would get really drunk. If, mm-hmm. if ultimately, if I were to run Die Hard, I would use your suggestion, Matthew, and just make it a narrative one upsmanship thing where we maybe stop, take shots, and keep going. Yeah. Yeah. Whoever's head bounces off the table first. <laughs> dies. <laughs> yeah. All right. That's I mean, good. It's, That's it's, good stuff. There are many options available in the role playing scene of doing something like this. But when it comes down to one player and one GM, uh, you don't really need a gaming system for that. It's, yeah. There are plenty of single player games out there that are pretty cool. There's one that I want to talk about for a different movie, but this game is called One Shot and uh, where you have, you know, one shot. You got one shot to take. It's all about building up to that ultimate moment of revenge. Didn't we but already do that? We did Clay not. Eastwood? We did not. Uh, no, 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 no. One shot was, it's going to be something else. Standing in the graveyard, one shot. All right. No, Just me. That, that was <laughs> Just a different you. game. Um, <laughs> but when it comes to single player games, it's okay. I'm, this is maybe the old granddad talking. Let's hear it. Granddad I, it's speaks just hard wisdom, for me baby. to think of any time where I would want to break out a gaming book off my shelf and, you know, go through the process of character creation and go through all the rules and, and have to deal with the dehydration rules and the drowning rules. And, yeah. and, and you can only climb, you have to roll a climb check for every 20 feet of rope that you climb. None of that's fun. None of that's exciting. If it's just one-on-one, fuck the rules. Let's just hash this out. Let's come up with yeah. a cool story and I take some shots. With you. Yeah. Yeah. That's my take on it. I, you're not, you know, people yeah, you are, don't need this. You need a penny or a quarter, something to flip. People are listening to this and they probably want some hardcore role playing advice. But for this one, I would say just no, put, the, put the gaming book away, get some playing cards or something, play poker, play a game of poker together or, or just some some kind of a cheap game and add a narration to everything that you do. No work. Go fish. Go <laughs> fish. <laughs> Motherfucker. <laughs> God damn. All right. So I'm sorry, listener. I don't think this is going to be some of the best gaming advice we've ever given. <laughs> Honestly, no, but it was it's a not. Good movie. No, no, it's it's some of the uh, the least saleable gaming advice yeah. we've given. Like, you're not going to rush out and buy this set because odds are you have a penny in your house. And, <laughs> yeah. if, you, and if you're listening to this podcast, you probably have many of yours too. <laughs> and so, I mean, yeah, on this one, I'm I'm with you. Feng, feng Shui, do it. Feng yeah. Shui too. Great game. Very but you don't games. need it. You don't need it. Yeah. Well, I think we've put this one to bed. We had something happen. We're having something happening, though, like the moment this this one airs. We are finally, after much background discussion and much hard work on the part of all of our hosts, launching a Patreon campaign to help pay our bills and to buy Matthew a pizza. Please, I'm very hungry. <laughs> he it's a small pizza. Since we started, and he's getting emaciated and starting to smell bad. So we're hoping, I thought I was just the old granddad. <laughs> it, it can be both. <laughs> well, I, I, the caloric value of old granddad, I imagine, is at least keeping him alive. What's the serving size? <laughs> anyway, we're launching a Patreon campaign I'd to help eight ounces, mainly to pay our bills. True. We've got a number of very basic pledge levels. We don't want to get anything too ridiculous, too high out there. They're at $1, $5, and $10. We've got a bunch of bonus content that we're going to start pushing into the Patreon feed. This is not stuff that normally makes it to our regular feed. That's going to remain the same free open access to everybody. Because we love you guys. But every time I edit one of these episodes, I cut out at least a half hour or more of tangents, side things, stuff that doesn't quite fit the episode or content that's really good, but would make the episode a little bit too long to be listened to during a you know, your daily commute or whatever. There's also things that are just foul. <laughs> let's, let, let's let's say that too. There are a number of um, foul, questionable, questionable yeah, tangents questionable. that we go on, which we might include, and Nothing they will be marked as that. such. But we also have other bonus content that we've started to record anew. Things like alternate cuts, things like additional movies that you might be interested in based on the movie that we recorded but something that we might otherwise never get to. 
but still rather fascinating. Yeah, I like this next one. Like the next one that we're going to be talking about. <laughs> Thank you, Gary Busey, for this one. Fucking Gary Busey. We've Give me got, two. We, by the time this episode launches, our Patreon campaign will be fresh, new, and live, and you can check it out. It will be linked in our show notes, and there will already be content in there just for you to enjoy. But even on top of that, tell him what he's won, Bob. We're going to start doing live feeds of our shows. We have an active Discord channel where people have already been discussing the movies with us. But we're also now going to be setting up a live feed of us recording in Discord with a chat window open here on a laptop next to us that we can check if you have any comments. And maybe we might respond to you or incorporate your feedback into our episodes. And we'll save that and for people that'll who... that'll be uh, Patreons only. Patrons only, yes. And that's any level, right? Even if you only chuck us a buck a month, you that, get access to No, that's to the that? highest level. That's, sure. it, yeah, again, we we say some questionable things on that's the true. air that yeah. get edited out. So I want to make sure that our hardcore fans, of which there might be one, are <laughs> going to uh, appreciate it. Yeah. But even at the lowest level, one thing that we're going to start doing again that we did for a while and had a lot of fun with, but kind of we holiday interference and whatnot, we stopped it, was having votes for what movie we're going to do next. We're going to start that back up again. And as an added bonus, we're going to put the votes both in Patreon for patrons only and live on our website for anybody, which effectively means that patrons will be able to vote twice on That's every right. movie that we that do. That means we will be your puppets and you will be the puppet masters at the low, low cost of $1. So even if you kick us a buck, make us dance, you'll get a stronger vote into the way that the show progresses. Yeah. I think that's pretty cool. I'd pay a buck for a vote. Your Southern came out. Yeah, yeah it's been drinking. <laughs> <with Brando. laughs> I'd pay a buck for a vote. <laughs> I'd buy that for a dollar. Kaye, motherfucker. And on and that note, guys, even if uh, even if you can't afford, I, I realize there's a lot of people out there. Just rest assured that we will keep doing what we do. And we thank you just for listening. If you want to take it that extra step, we'd appreciate that even more. But most most importantly is that you guys sit there and you listen to us. Yeah, we really we, appreciate we the hell that. out of that. Love you for that. Thank you. And just to reiterate, these episodes will forever remain free. We're not going to lock anything that we behind the paywall. Do. Yeah, it's all going to be out there. So if you want to kick us a buck or two, I mean. Please, we appreciate it, but we're not going to stop doing this if you don't. Yeah. And we're not going to hide this from anybody who doesn't. Yeah, that's a good blurb. I like this. Yeah. It's good stuff. So anyway. Oh, God. Oh, God, right. Yeah. <laughs> Forgot about I'll that. I'll leave you with this little teaser. Fucking Gary Busey. <laughs> anyway. She used up so much scene. If we haven't turned you Born away from crazy. this concept already, please check out our Patreon. It's going to be linked in the show notes when this goes live. What's coming next? Oh, you're going to love this one. This is one of my personal favorites from an old book that I read back when I was a child. It's uh, the adaptation of Robert Heinlein's fantastic Starship Troopers. Yeah. Yeah. Boobs and bugs, baby. Nice. Boobs and bugs. Would you like to know more? Would you like to know more? Oh, you just, I was just about to say that. Uh, <laughs> gotta be fast. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening. Uh, that's it for uh, this episode. I'm Matthew. And I'm Dusty. And I'm Nathaniel. And we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to another episode of our show. If you're enjoying our content, please leave us a review on iTunes with your thoughts. They really help us get the word out. And also drop us a line on all of the usual social media sites, too. You can find the links right there in the show notes. You can also leave a comment or contact us through our website at havemovieswillgame.com. We look forward to hearing from you. We now have a Patreon campaign, too, so throw us a buck or two if you're so inclined. And we heartily thank you for helping us pay the bills. Have Movies Will Game is a Breakfast Puppies podcast production, and our episodes are distributed under CC BYND 4.0 license. Our opening theme is Rock and Gravel by Sid Valentine's Patent Leather Kids, with intro narration provided by Isaac Scher. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time.